This is a man with problems. His name is Jim Dooley, and the team he coaches, the Chicago Bears, are the losingest in pro football. None of Dooley's difficulties are small ones. The most troublesome is quarterback, where he settled on a number one draft choice, Bobby Douglas, a rookie, and a lefty at that. There is a bright spot, however, and it wears the number 40. For those who still wonder if Gale Sayers is all the way back from injury, just watch. Today, it's the Bears and the Browns in a duel between the two finest runners in the pros, Sayers and Leroy Kelly, who appears to be dethroned after winning the rushing crown the past two years. Kelly suffered an injury during the season, and his statistics reflect it. The man who has been carrying most of the load is Bill Nelson, a crafty quarterback whose talents are sometimes deprecated. But nothing can detract from his leadership qualities or his growing reputation as a winner. Blanton Collier's record is nothing short of amazing. Super teams come and go, but the Browns continue to win. Today, they can take their third straight Century Division title. This despite some major injuries and the startling total of 12 rookies. Yet Cleveland continues to roll on. Today, they hope to do it against the bruising Bears of Chicago. I'm Jack Whitaker, and this is the NFL Game of the Week. It was the Bears, not the Browns, who rolled. On the first play, Bobby Douglas lobbed to his fullback, Mike Hull, in the flat. Erich Barnes hooked the ball, but the Bears recovered the fumble for a large Chicago game. Then Gale Sayers went to work. He ran right through the midsection of the Browns' defense on two successive plays. Sayers personally gave Chicago a second first down on the ball on Cleveland's 33. Dooley says his quarterback thinks the passing pocket is anywhere behind the line of scrimmage. Despite some amazing escape artistry, Douglas came up empty on this play. Cleveland linebacker John Garlington stayed with Sayers throughout the scramble to make a save. But Douglas can throw in the conventional manner also. Watch number 80, Jerry Simmons, move on rookie Walt Sumner, number 29. He almost fooled number 34, veteran safety Mike Howell. The Bears were now on the Cleveland 22. Again, Douglas remained pocketed, and despite being rushed, he found number 89, Bob Wallace, who showed what individual effort is all about. The Bears were on the board, seven to nothing. The first play for the Browns was a portentous one, as it set a trend for the entire game. The battering Bear defense simply swarmed Leroy Kelly. Long known for their powerful ground attack, Cleveland has had a surprisingly tough time running this year. Kelly's injury has been a great factor, and the highly prized offensive line continues to open the doors. Center Fred Hoagland guards Gene Hickerson and John Damari and tackles Dick Shafrath and Monty Clark take tremendous pride in Cleveland's running reputation. So the Browns seem determined to run against Chicago. But in this first series, and most of the day, Cleveland couldn't gain on the ground. Don Cockroft was forced to punt, but a roughing the kicker penalty gave the Browns a first down and a new life. They couldn't capitalize on it. The reason why was number 51, Dick Butkus' determination on this submarine tackle of Leroy Kelly explains why his defensive coach, Jim Carr, considers him the best player in the NFL.
Cleveland had to punt again. And incredibly, they got another break. With number 55, rookie lineman Chuck Reynolds recovered Gary Lyle's fumble. This time, the Browns did something to take advantage of the break. Kelly finally got the chance to display his moves. He lost the ball, but was out of bounds at the time of the error. Next, it was number 30 rookie fullback Ron Johnson. Notice the blocking of number 44 Kelly and number 42 Paul Warfield on this play. This is the key to Cleveland's great success over the years. Everybody blocks, even 180 pound receivers. But this wasn't Cleveland's day for running the ball. On a fourth down and two at the Chicago 14, the Browns disdained a field goal attempt and sent Kelly to get the two yards. He didn't make it, and the Bears took over as the quarter ended. The Bears were determined to increase their lead when Mike Hull, with good acceleration, contributed a 14-yard burst. Then Gail Sayers personally handled most of the remaining distance to the goal. Sayers was just 95 yards away from the league rushing leader, and he really went after it. He would total almost 90 yards in the first half alone. With only three minutes gone in the second period, Sayers leaped across the goal for Chicago's second touchdown and a 14 to nothing lead. Cleveland finally went to the air. Nelson dumped a pass over the middle to his tight end, Milt Morin, who bulled his way for extra yardage. Kelly kept the defense honest by slicing his way around left end. Then on first and 10, Nelson threw his first long pass of the day, and Gary Collins hauled it in 40 yards downfield. A repeat amply shows the excellent protection Nelson had on the play. Cleveland quarterbacks have been tackled only 11 times all season. One of the best marks in the league. And today, Nelson's guardians were determined to protect his gimpy legs from the bruising bear blitz. Collins hadn't lost his defender, Benny McRae. He simply outpositioned him and used his height to beat the bears to the ball. With Chicago Collins conscious, Nelson, again with plenty of time, hit Warfield, slamming over the middle, and the lithe receiver floated into the end zone for the Browns' first score. The sign made a suggestion, and Gail Sayers gladly complied as he skittered 21 yards on the first play of Chicago's new series. Then with first and 10 at midfield, Douglas tried the bomb. Number 45, Dick Gordon, is the Bears' swiftest receiver, and he had a step on his defender, number 40, Erich Barnes. But the old man, as the 12-year veteran is called, made the big play to break up a certain score. Another look at Barnes's heroics reveals he was helped by his six foot three inch height as he reached over the smaller Gordon to make the kind of save a defensive back cherishes. There might have been some extra satisfaction because it was the Bears who drafted the aggressive Barnes from Purdue University. Bobby Douglas took matters into his own hands. Carrying the ball like the proverbial loaf of bread, he scrambled 27 yards deep into Cleveland territory.
Douglas relinquished the role of runner to workhorse Sayers, who continually shot into the Cleveland secondary before the line could react. A penalty brought the ball back, so Gale tried again. When Cleveland was called for pass interference, the Bears had the ball on the four. Two hundred and twenty pound Mike Hall took it in for the third Chicago score of the half. The Bears twenty one, the Browns seven. Momentum means a great deal in football and only the good teams can turn it around to their advantage. With time running out in the half, Bill Nelson came out winging. Leroy Kelly gathered in a strike near the left sideline and it sprung him for large yardage. Jim Dooley might have suspected his lead was only temporary. Then Nelson employed massive Milt Morin on two successive plays, and he tore through the bare defense. The 240-pounder wasn't expected to play this year after a spinal operation. Dooley watched as Ron Johnson went in from the one to pull the Browns to within a touchdown as the half ended. 21 to 14. Hanging on to a precarious seven point lead, the Bears entered the second half with more than an even chance to gain their second win of the year if they could only hold on to the ball. They couldn't. On his first series, Douglas fumbled, and number 88, Ron Snydow, recovered for the Browns. Cleveland has been known to quickly capitalize on a break. Nelson hit Morin, but the big tight end didn't want it. Nelson came right back to Collins on a sideline pattern for nine, and everybody on the Browns was satisfied with the result. Everyone, that is, except setback Ron Johnson. Why? Let's see what happened to number 30 on the last play. Ouch! This is why the Bears are so well loved by their fellow football players from coast to coast. With a third and one, Nelson called a play action pass and it worked to perfection. A good fake, a good throw, a great catch. 24 yards and a touchdown. On a repeat from our super slow motion camera, Nelson's fake froze the defense while he also caught the Bears, number 55, Doug Buffoon, in a blitz. Nelson easily beat the blitz lofting a spiral over the hands of two bear defenders and into the hands of Chip Glass, number 83, whose juggling catch tied the score. It was an auspicious debut for Glass, who replaced Morin for this play and made his only catch of the game. Bears 21, Browns 21. The rest of the quarter was a titanic defensive struggle. The Browns and Leroy Kelly were completely stymied by the aggressive Chicago defense. Kelly was held to 50 yards on the day. Of course, the Bears' defense is led by Dick Butkus, number 51, who is considered by some the best all-around player in pro football. If he's not the best, he's definitely the toughest. The Bears prohibited any advance by Cleveland, either on the ground or through the air. The only consolation for Kelly on this last play was that Butkus wasn't in on the tackle due to his premature blitz and premature fall. The Bears could do no better in this quarter. Douglas did manage a scramble or two, but that was all. The only reason he got 11 on the last play was due to Douglas's quick thinking after a mix-up on a planned handoff to Sayers that Ron Snydow fell for and left the Browns' right side open. But the Browns' defense was extra tough against the pass, both short and long. And this drive was halted on a short tackle by number 50, linebacker John Garlington, as the Bears failed to cross midfield once in the third quarter.
At the end of the period, Cleveland started a drive that looked like it might be productive. Nelson hit his favorite target, number 86, Gary Collins, twice for a total of 30 yards and moved to midfield as the quarter ended. But as the final period began, the Browns' threat also ended as Nelson gave the Bears the ball with Cleveland's only turnover of the game. Chicago now had a chance to capitalize on an unexpected break. The score still tied at 21. The Bears tried some razzle-dazzle right after the fumble recovery, but Cleveland's alert defense stopped the end around to Wallace Cole. But Sayers and Douglas then led Chicago to the gateway to Cleveland's end zone. Sayers became the fourth man ever to gain over 100 yards in 20 games and moved into the National Football League lead in rushing, while Douglas continued to scramble with the best of them. On third and two, Sayers just made a first down to keep the drive going to the eighth. But from here, the Browns' defense displayed championship form. On three plays, the Bears got only to the three, as a gang-tackling group of youngsters and veterans that is the Browns' defense refused to budge. Coach Dooley refused to gamble on fourth down, so Percival kicked a 10-yard field goal, and Chicago now led 24 to 21. The lead lasted three minutes. Combining his ground game with his potent air attack, Bill Nelson led Cleveland to the go-ahead touchdown. Nelson was determined to set up his passing by running at the flanks of the Bears' defense, and Bo Scott, number 35, who replaced Ron Johnson, did just that. The yardage wasn't that important. The threat of yardage was, so as to make the Bear defenders wary of the run. Sure enough, Nelson then flipped to Kelly on a flare pattern, and number 44 rambled 29 yards to the Bears' 42. The cool and confident field general had been working particularly hard on Gary Collins' man, the veteran Benny McRae. And on the next play, behind good protection, Nelson hit Collins for the sixth time in the game. Collins made an outstanding effort after the catch, losing McRae, faking another defender, number 44, Gary Lyle, before finally being upended on the seven-yard line. Collins is leading the NFL in touchdowns and enjoying his best year since 1965. Of course, Bill Nelson's accurate arm is a major reason. From the seven, it took one play to put the Browns into the lead for the first time in the game. Ron Johnson, now back in the game, skirted left and went in untouched. On the touchdown, number 23, Dick Daniels, tried a safety blitz. This left the rear zone of the Bear defense open, and Johnson had no trouble scoring, putting the Browns ahead 28 to 24, and leaving them five minutes away from a century division crown. The Browns always seem to play just well enough to win, and even though this isn't a must game, by now they must have sensed the taste of an early celebration coming their way. In order to get that early celebration, the Browns had to run out the clock, and when they got the ball again late in the game, they tried, but failed to do so. The voracious Bears were hungry for victory, and led by their fearless leader, Dick Butkus, the Bears were able to prevent Cleveland from controlling the rest of the game. But as they have done all year, the Bears really beat themselves. They forced a punt, but Cecil Turner fumbled the punt, and Cleveland had the ball again, with more opportunity to run out the clock, though they didn't score here.
so Bobby Douglas and Chicago got one final chance. Down four points with one minute left to play. Douglas has been criticized in and out of Chicago for scrambling too much. Today he stayed in the pocket most of the game, and this is what happened to him, even when he did release soon enough. On third down, he again stayed in the pocket. Moved up and threw to number 89, Bob Wallace. His accurate rifle pass was there, but so was number 56, Bob Matheson. So Douglas now had to go for broke. Forty-five yards later, Wallace had taken the Bears to the Cleveland 46. There was time for one more play. Douglas faded back, rolled left, and heaved a towering bomb towards the goal line. It almost worked. Instead, the Chicago Bears left the friendly confines of Wrigley Field with their 10th loss of the year, assuring them of their worst season in their 50-year history. Even though they had gained as many yards as the Browns, Chicago couldn't take advantage of Cleveland's only mistake while they themselves lost three fumbles. This was the real key to the game. But as Blanton Collier jubilantly left the field with his third straight Century Division crown, he knew that his team had a tradition of making the breaks go their way. And in three weeks, he would once again try to find the key to the Eastern Conference Championship and unlock the door to New Orleans.